financiers are always looking at who is the ultimate audience, like what is my exit strategy? There's always financiers who also, you know, for, have their own mission statements. They want to see representation on the screen. Um, they're looking for stories that might speak to them individually, but they're also looking for sustainability. You see financiers always looking at what is working in the marketplace. Um, and then how do we capture that as investors? So I always like to begin this clinic with setting the table because we have filmmakers from the US and international filmmakers, fiction and nonfiction, and, and, and the financing models for all of those projects can be a little bit different of mix of equity and soft money and whatnot. So um, to the panel, whoever wants to, you know, I think uh, on the fiction side, equity is very popular. Could someone tell us what is equity and how does it play in a financing plan? I can answer that. Attorneys are great for this. <laughs> um, so equity financing is financing that is an at-risk investment in your business. You know, as an independent content creator, filmmaker, um, you are creating a business and you need capital to fund that business. And oftentimes that capital comes from either individuals or entities who want to invest in your business, either because they love you and what you're doing, or they really want to make some money. So an equity investment is really just that. It's it's a person who's coming in and investing in your property, in your project, and taking a risk that they're going to make their money back or not. There's no guarantee that your equity investor is ever going to see their money back. But in exchange for that, they get certain premiums, they get a percentage of net profits. So they get perks in the event of in the event of success. Um, and you touched on it really briefly on debt. But debt is something that if you do take, you have to pay back. You have to pay it back. With and interest. With interest, and usually a lot of interest. And film loans, as, we all, as most of us know, are very onerous loans with pretty horrible terms. Sometimes you need to do it to get your project made. But, you know, I, I, we have a lot of clients who don't have distribution, especially on the nonfiction side, and they want to take out a loan. But then there's repayment terms, and they have to pay by a certain day. They're like, "Oh, well, it's fine. I'll get distribution by this date, and I'll, you know, we'll have the money back." And I'm like, "No, no, 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 <laughs> that's not gonna. That may not happen. And we really have to account for worst case scenario because we don't want our clients to be in default of a loan." Um, let's talk about soft money. What what is that? Like non, uh, you know, grant money, tax monies. How does that come into play? Nina, maybe do you want to talk a little bit more about tax incentives? Sure. Um, well, one thing I want to um, work off of what you just said in terms of loans, oftentimes um, productions will come to us and get pre-qualified for the rebate so that then they can go to their lenders and say, look, we know that we're going to get X amount of money from the rebate. So they're loan, they want to get a loan against the rebate. So that's one way that... Can that, you take a step back and actually yeah. define what are rebates? How does that yes. work in this system? Okay, so um, ours is a cash rebate. And if you are a filmmaker, you're coming to us and you're applying at least four to six weeks beforehand for actual, a check at the end of your production. So ours is a 25 to 35% cash rebate. That's 25% back on whatever you spend with vendors and businesses in Mississippi, 25% back on the non-resident payroll. So for example, your actors, your directors, anybody that's from California that's going to Mississippi to work, um, their payroll while they're in Mississippi is eligible for the rebate. 30% uh, on residents in Mississippi, plus an extra 5% for any resident in Mississippi that's also a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. So that's up to 35%. So um, you're going to apply before you actually spend money in Mississippi. You go into production when you're done with all of your work in Mississippi. So that could even be post-production if you post in Mississippi. Then you're going to send all of your ledgers and accounting work to the Department of Revenue for a full line-by-line -line audit. So I don't want to like fool anybody and think... That, you know, you just spend your money and then you get a check. There's a lot of work that goes into creating these documents so that you can be audited. Um, and if you do that quickly, I mean, if you do that efficiently and the way that you need to, to do it for the Department of Revenue to audit, it is likely that you're going to get a check 90 days after submission. So it's very quick comparatively to a tax credit. Um, can you define what the what is the difference between a rebate versus a credit? 
Yeah, so in a credit, you're actually, you're going to that jurisdiction and you're getting a tax credit, which somebody in that jurisdiction, somebody that lives there, business that lives there, needs that. And they can broker that and buy that from you so that they're paying less in taxes eventually. So it's, it's a little more complicated than uh, a rebate. Um, and just to be clear, with regards to um, qualification and financing, you talked about if you get approved by your office for a credit in Mississippi, you still need to go out and find the money to cover it until you get the rebate. And so right. what, how are ways that filmmakers cover that? You talked about debt, but then do you find that others use equity to cover that as well? Or? Certainly, yeah. I mean, it's a mixture. It's a mixture. I mean, every project that comes to us is diverse in their funding <laughs> every time. I don't know that we've ever really come across um, someone that's just like, oh, I've got all equity funding. That I don't. That maybe that happens. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't happen very often in, in our experience. And just because we we know and love some beautiful films that we've supported at Film Independent through our artist development programs that have shot in Mississippi, um, like The Inspection and All Dirt Roads Taste of Salt, um, what makes your tax incentive different from other municipalities? Well, so there. It's either going to be a credit, a tax credit, or a cash rebate. So we stand out because we are a cash rebate. Um, it has a good reputation at this point. It's been around for 20 years, so it's one that producers trust. It's not going anywhere. It's not going to expire or sunset. Our legislature set it up so that there's no expiration date on it. The, our legislators would have to actually purposefully go in and try to kill it. It's not, there's no end date on it. So are there any caps stable. or minimums? Are there any caps? Yes, yeah. there are caps. Um, five million per individual, um, the salary, up to five million on the salary. Um, so if your actor gets paid $10 million and we're only going to rebate up to the first five million uh, and $10 million per project. Annually, we have $20 million plus we have an additional 10 million for episodic work. Um, so a total of $30 million per year. We have been maxing that out in the last four years, so it's likely that we will get more money. So you guys come visit And us. is there a minimum budget for projects? Um, $50,000. It's really low. Yeah. All right. Let's all go to Mississippi. Please um, come. Please come. <laughs> Although I will say, you know, I want all of you to come to Mississippi, but again, I'm, I'm on the um, board for the FCI, so I want you all to know that there are jurisdictions all over the world that might make sense for your projects. We are a free resource, a free resource to you. We are usually attached to the government or some nonprofit, and we're here to help you. When I started in the film office, film offices were mostly helping with locations and finding resources in, a, in their particular jurisdiction. We obviously do much more than that now. We are an investor in your film. So use us for our incentives, but also use us for your locations and connecting to the community that you're filming in. We're trying to make your life easier in our jurisdictions. We want to be kind of an additional producer for you in our jurisdictions. Great, thank you. Um, I also want to talk about, I think it's very important, on the nonfiction side, fiscal sponsorship. Lisa, can you talk a little bit about what fiscal sponsor ship is and how it can be worked not only in nonfiction projects, but <clears throat> fiction projects as well. Like the wonderful program that Film Independent yes, has. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, fiscal sponsorship is really great, especially, I mean, it's for scripted and unscripted projects, but we see it happen more on the unscripted side, I just think because it's, um, it's socially based, you know, there's a cause that somebody's interested in. But um, fiscal sponsorship is wonderful, especially if you have relationships with wealthy individuals who need tax deductions, which some of us happen to know those people, and they'd rather donate to you than invest because they don't necessarily want to take the risk. They don't necessarily think it's a good business investment, but they need to have money that they're spending that gives them tax deductions. A fiscal sponsorship is when a filmmaker teams up with a not-for-profit organization. Film Independent has a fiscal sponsorship program. Um, and the individual donates to the not-for-profit and the not-for-profit funnels it through to the filmmaker and the filmmaker doesn't have to become a not-for-profit. So it's kind of, it's really a win-win because the individual gets a tax deduction. The organization is, gets a benefit because they get a fee for doing that. 
and then the individual filmmaker gets the money and it's non-recoupable money. So it's actually really great because you don't have to pay it back. Um, and it's, it works really, really well when you have individuals who, who you need to have, who want to have a tax deduction. Um, and because we do have a contingency of international filmmakers uh, here, how can inter international filmmakers benefit from this US-based system? That's a good question. I think they, they would have to have U.S. investors. I think if it's not a U.S. investor, you'd probably have to figure, they'd probably have to figure out a way to do that internationally in the country, which the investor lives in. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. But for international filmmakers, if it's a very topical theme and they find, you know, potential donors in the U.S., who want that tax write-off, they could, Absolutely. and, and they're, they set up an account in the U.S. and are able to receive that funding, Absolutely. they could apply for fiscal sponsorship in the U.S. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, that's actually a good segue. We see we, we were just talking beforehand about international co-production. International co-production. You know, as equity seems harder to source in the U.S., mm. I feel like producers and filmmakers are Looking abroad, can you talk a little bit about your experience with international co-production? Yeah, but I, mean, I think you made a really good point about the content actually driving the movements that you make. So, you know, not all stories are created equal. You know, if you've got a story that resonates with a group of, of, of like-minded individuals who have foundations, that's a good place to start. Because then they'll not only potentially support you financially, they'll also be, you know, sometimes they'll support screenings. They'll, you can, I've seen people build... Um, entire distribution plans around these kinds of relationships. And I think that we're in a moment where you have to be really creative because we are in the U.S. sitting in a, a retraction or a rec whatever you want to call what's happening right now. And it's Shitty probably, times. No, but it's probably worth... It's, <laughs> but it's probably worth breaking that down before we go on, you know, to talk about the fact that, you know, where we're sitting, and you know this so well, you know, we have the streaming wars that where everybody was competing to... To, you know, working to compete with Netflix and abandoning traditional models of, you know, di distribution through film and television and commercial television and, and theatrical. So we kind of rushed to that, went into the pandemic, and there was this artificial growth that went on until people returned to normal life. And then people started dropping subscriptions as they would. They're, they're, they're too busy to watch 18 subscriptions. And so these companies began to realize, oh my God, we've borrowed billions. And Wall Street's like, yeah, you did. So where's the, where's the return on investment? And they started realizing that they had to do something about it. So we started seeing these massive cuts. You know, we, I think it started with in September of 22 when Warner Brothers fired 7,500 people. And, you know, the, it's gone on until this very minute. I mean, every time, I, and I'm sure you go through this, I'll call somebody and they're gone. And so, you know, a lot of what we've done, which is an investment in, you know, thousands of relationships that have taken 15, 20, 30 years to build. And people are all, it's all in flux right now because you don't, people don't know where they are. Companies don't know what they're doing. They don't really have mandates. They're a bit frozen. So it's important. I think it's important to talk about that territory. And then we had our strikes as well. And we're trying to grapple with technology. So all these things are creating a perfect storm at the moment. And by the way, they're happening in a slower pace around the world. So we, you know, we kind of have to know that that's what we're up against, and so it takes a lot of it takes a lot of cleverness. So back to what we're saying, like the, you know, when you when you read a script, if it's um, if it's, for example, set in a fictional world, um, that opens things up. I mean, we 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 helped create the French tax incentives, and the f first film that got the incentives were, were was Thor for for Marvel, because we did the VFX in Paris. And what we realized in working through that incentive was that anybody that was from the mythical kingdom of Asgard counted as French. Because, so, you know, if you have an alien, they're French. You know, and so, you know, you've got to really study, guys. I mean, come on. So, you know, you study, you've got to really study your incentives and find ways to make them work for you. So we went to them like, can, can we, oh yeah, this qualifies. So it was kind of, it was kind of, kind of fantastic. And it was a very exciting thing to bring a, a check, you know, of one point five million dollars, and give it to that studio. But that's how we got that job. And um, you know, so I'm saying all this to say, like, you, you've got there's a lot of work to do. You know, as, as you're saying, there's a there's a world of incentives out there. They're all different. Um, there are also uh, institutions that are very interested in, in funding, and there are grants. So I think that all those things have to be looked at to put, you know, a project in motion now. 
and that there's no reason not to, you know, you've got to shake the trees, you've got to do it, you've got to do the homework, but it, it, you know, it pays off. Hi, Christine. Hi. As a packaging agent <laughs> at CAA, you see a lot. Um, can you speak to, I guess, more on the independent film side? What are the films that you're able to take on to try to seek financing at this place? And what are the investors looking to invest in? Um, I mean, you, sp you spoke to it. The, the landscape has changed significantly since I started 10 years ago when Netflix, Amazon, eventually Apple started really spending a lot of money acquiring films, especially in the independent space. And there was certainly this arms race to build a library. Um, and we're, what we're seeing is now that has ended. So, or is coming to a more maybe healthy, uh, <laughs> in an optimistic sense, um, balance. And so, you know, a lot of the equity financiers we're working with, um, they're no longer banking on that big streaming deal. So a lot of the budgets, which everything has gotten more expensive post-pandemic, but at the same time, financiers are less inclined to put their money at risk. So everyone is looking for, you know, smart finance structures where their money is not as exposed. And so that means going internationally, looking at co-production, really understanding um, the treaties, which countries will work with which, and building these relationships. There are a lot of producers who are building alliances across countries and working together to make the most of all that soft money um, because there is more support in the European system. So if there are ways to build a co-production structure that can be helpful, you know, it, financiers are always looking at who is the ultimate audience? Like what is my exit strategy? There's al always financiers who also, you know, for, have their own mission statements. They want to see representation on the screen. Um, they're looking for stories that might speak to them individually, or you know, they have other goals that they're trying to obtain, but they're also looking for sustainability. So building an overall slate that you know they can take some risk here. This is their passion project. They'll put you know two million of equity at risk, um, but they're also looking at putting you know, debt or a smaller piece within a bigger project, which they feel more confident in recouping. Um, but it is about looking at, you know, you always want your financiers also to be bold and be looking for trailblazers and, you know, the, the next auteur filmmakers, the next filmmakers who are really pushing forward form and structure and all of that. Um, but at the same time, where you're, you're talking about what's working in the marketplace, you know, horror genre, that's something that we see um, really perform theatrically. And also, you know, I, I think that we're always, we're always looking for the project that speaks to someone and has that moment at a film festival that, you know, something like DD, something like Minari, which is a very specific story, but engages your audience as universal, and then has that incredible emotional catharsis for audiences. So it's not, it's not an easy answer, but I think it's always in response to trends that you see financiers always looking at what is working in the marketplace, um, and then how do we capture that as investors. Um, I just wanted to touch back a little bit on the international side, just because U.S. is not, uh, doesn't participate in co-production treaties, right? So as U.S.-based filmmakers, how have you seen partnerships work with international co-productions? Well, for me, it's been a question of like, it's been client-driven. I've got clients all over the world, and one of the best examples right now is a director I work with out of South Africa, and he is... His films have performed really, really well, and we have a three-picture deal with Netflix. But it, you know, that's great. But we wanted some more autonomy, and so we put together a slate, like she was saying, of six pictures, and we took it to the South African government, and they have a, um, a branch called the uh, 
uh, the IDC that invest, you know, to, to create uh, jobs for their own economy. And so it took us about a year to prove the case that we could do this. We had to bring in distribution. We had to do all these things. Because again, it's key to have distribution to, because at the end of the day, if you're not distributing, you really aren't showing us how the money's coming back. So we had to, we had to prove all that, that we could make a model for African content, which is still emerging on the global platform. And we did it. So now we have 49% financing for this slate of films, and it only took a year, you know. And that, I, mean, I mean, of concentrated work. What was great for me is that, you know, with LA and the US being a bit quiet, I could put a lot of energy into that. And so we're a little bit making history there. And so I think it's, it's, it's about collaborating with people from other cultures. I think we've learned through streaming that audiences around the world are very curious about other cultures, that this sort of, you know, myopic view that old Hollywood had, which is that they only want to see this, and they don't want to see that, and they won't pay that, and they don't like subtitles. Well, that's all gone out of the window in seven years, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, I think the performance of Squid Games, of Money Heist, these things, these kinds of shows and films, Fauda, which is, was number one on Netflix, is in Hebrew and Arabic. I mean, people are, can't get enough of it around the world. So I think we've got to be a bit more um, adventurous. And then we've got to do the homework. As, as you were saying, you know, it's like they're, 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 you can't just wish this into being. You've got to do the work. You've got to study it. You've got to learn to understand incentives. They're all different. You've got to understand treaties between countries. But a lot of, underneath all that, it can make sense for a story. Or, or you find something that's naturally, uh, you know, organically uh, international. You know, the collision of cultures is always a fascinating, you know, subject matter. So you find those things that make sense, that work, and then work from there, and then you architect your, your plan. Um, I want to touch on some other forms of, like, ways to find financing for your film. And I feel like a trend I've been hearing more about is funding through corporations and companies and sort of branded content. Steve, Christine, can you talk about any stories or projects that you've had involvement in how we might be able to leverage that if equity is not coming through because the distribution <laughs> market is in so in flux? I, I mean, I, it's it's actually an area that we, I think as, as film finance agents um, need to do a little more work in um, because this is, I, I feel like corporate, like the branded sponsorships, um, a lot of that is, is based on studio level movies because ultimately they're always looking at, you know, what's the audience reach? And so really finding the opportunity for independent films is really important in figuring out like what is the sell um, for, is that me? Oh no. <laughs> what, is the, what is the sell for a company? Um, there is one example, um, St. Laurent is, is um, a company that has been putting money into film. They, invested in Emilia Perez, which is Jacques Odiard's film. I believe they also invested in Cronenberg's film. Um, but that's, there, there is some product placement in, in those films, but it does actually come from a love of filmmakers and the belief that, um, you know, film, cinema, and fashion are married in, in a way that's really natural, and then you have, these stars, you know, you're going to Cannes, and there's a lot of opportunity for the for the um, fashion house to be featured. Um, but honestly, it's not. It's it's something that we get asked a lot of our clients when we've come, we've exhausted every every source. Um, you know, gone to a list of 45, 50 financiers gone to all the independent distributors, to the studios, to the streamers, and it's always inevitably like, what about, what about some product placement? Um, but I do think there's work to be done to kind of you know, find, find a way to really sell that opportunity to, to companies, to brands. You know, I agree with that. I think there is a huge opportunity right now because traditional advertising is kind of failing, and um, if your storyline resonates with the with the directives and the goals of a certain company, I would say be bold and go approach them, because it is everybody's looking for alternatives right now, and I think we are on a frontier of this kind of shift. I mean, we've used product placement in, in films, but it's been limited to like we'll give you X amount of money, and this character's riding this motorcycle, 
and you know it looks really good in the film and I realized you know in a retrospect in one of these films I probably should have pushed harder because we could have done a Tom Cruise style uh, premiere with everybody on motorcycles and I was like damn it you know but but I think but I, you know, I'm, I'm being sort of flippant about that but I think you should think about everything you can do with a product that puts it in a positive light and and, and that goes to even something that might seem silly like a premiere, but that's valuable. And, you know, because those things go viral. If you have a cool experience that only people who are there to witness it and or you watching it on, online, that's, that's it's exciting. But, you know, it's not new. I mean, James Bond has been wearing beautiful watches and driving beautiful cars and drinking Heineken, you know, and other things. I think I heard you once speak about, like, hair love. To oh, yeah. That was a film that was um, an Oscar-winning short animation film and it won an Oscar because it was, it was a spectacular story. But it, at the end of the day, it wound up being financed by Dove Soap because it was about hair care. And, but it aligned perfectly with their mission and what better way to advertise a soap. A million dollars for a brand like that is not a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a short film. But a short film that wins an Oscar that people are in love with and they send it to people voluntarily because it has this gorgeous message of love connection and it's so authentic and real so yeah i mean that's a perfect example i want to talk about the unscripted space and we don't see a lot of features coming to mississippi that are branded in that way but we have a show called hometown that's on hgtv it's one of the biggest home renovation shows on television now they're going into season nine and they have Viking Range that's um, one of their sponsors. So in every house, there's a Viking Range. It also happens to be a Mississippi company. It's a very high-end stovetop range. Um, there is a window company that partners with them. There are artists that partner with them. So the featured art on the walls and then on the, their website, then all of these vendors um, and companies are listed there so, so viewers can find those um, beautiful items so mm -hmm. it's it's really interesting to watch hometown evolve um i would never have thought that a home renovation show would have been such a calling card for mississippi but we have people moving to mississippi because of the show the um the way that mississippi is viewed now like the perception of mississippi while there are a lot of negative negative stereotypes of mississippi and of the south i think this show has done a tremendous amount to change um, the perceptions of the South, and then to have these products also be part of the part of the project is really cool to see. And just I would add on to that in, in the nonfiction space, even in traditional docs, we do see this type of funding more often than one might think. It's a little bit tricky because we always want to make sure that the filmmaker maintains his creative integrity and final cut, and you know that there's no. Um, real influence from the brand, but oftentimes there are brands that just naturally align. You know, if you think about an extreme sports doc and you get North Face to put in $500,000 and they wear North Face jackets, like that guy probably already wears North Face jackets, or an athlete who's already sponsored by somebody and they put in money into the film. So there's been lots of creative ways that we've been able to do that. And I've actually found that some of those brands are extraordinarily flexible. You know, they'll come with like a one page deal term and they're like, here's $500,000, just put our sticker on your boat or whatever. And you're like, okay. Um, <laughs> so they're like, do we need something longer? I'm like, no, this is great. Let's just <laughs> leave it like this. But it is interesting because sometimes I will find it's, it's such a small amount of money for them that these deals actually end up being very fast and, and really easy money occasionally. It doesn't always happen that way, but there there are ways in which it all works together very nicely. That's amazing to hear. New avenues for everyone to do research oh, after this yes. conversation. <laughs> um, we need to move on to the pitches, but I'd love to get kind of, you know, final thoughts from the panelists on, you know, things that they're optimistic about in our industry at this time. I won't go down. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> um, I mean, there's one film that I want to talk about, which I thought was incredibly inspirational, just is the film Sing Sing, um, which <laughs> was put together in a way where, you know, uh, Greg Quidar and Clint Bentley and their producer, Monique Walton, put together the film in a way where every single person, um, you know, every actor, every, you know, um, crew member 
had a share, they were all paid equally, and they all had an equal share um, in the film. And so ultimately, you know, I, I think part of the magic of the film, which is an extraordinary film, is that it was this true collaborative effort, and you, you feel, you know, every person that was a part of it, and it, it is so, it, there's such um, an authenticity to what the film is. Um, and it's a film that we, you know, we represented, we brought to Toronto and ultimately sold to A24. And in that process, it was, you know, negotiating our, our leverage was like, you, we gotta get everyone out of the film and to make money. Um, and that became a really powerful piece of leverage in the negotiation process. And I think that is like a really, you know, beautiful way to make a film, and especially when it's successful for everyone um, who had a piece of it to, to share in that success. And I know that's a model that they intend to, you know, build and, and hopefully sustain, and especially in bringing up the next generation of um, filmmakers and voices, and in and, and a way, I think, also to sustain across the industry is, you know, I think there's a lot of turmoil um, because of the contraction that the business is experiencing. And so when you're taking these big leaps, these risks to be a part of a film, um, it's great when, you know, not just the lead actor, not just, you know, the director, not just, you know, the, the financier, is is sharing in the success, but it's you know very equitable. Equitable. It's an ethos. If you haven't read any case studies on Sing Sing, it's worth it. Coleman Domingo was paid the exact same amount as the PA, right? And everyone bought into that, and they were all invested in the film, which is really powerful. And look, Christine's an agent, and she, look, the optimism from an agent of like this creative thinking That's, is really it's awesome, inspirational. Right? Yeah, yeah, to see something like that. Thank you. I'm not going to say I'm optimistic because I think that in chaos there's opportunity and it's up to all of us in here to reinvent the way things are being done and I think that's an opportunity because we've, we've, we've had a, a system that it kind of excluded a lot of people um, for many, many reasons. We don't need to go into that but the fact is that when, they're, when everything's been shaken up, it's time to run, run, run forward, run towards your goal. You have, very, you have a lot fewer obstacles because if you're coming with a solution, people are going to listen to you. So I think, you know, challenge yourself to be as well informed, as creative as you can be based on the logic of what you're dealing with and, you know, teach, teach all of us how to, how to move forward. Thank you. I'm hopeful because we have seen in Mississippi that, like I said, we're spending all of our money every year the last couple of years. Um, while projects have been on hold because post-strike, and during strikes, of course, um, we're now seeing like this month, we've had five productions in Mississippi, just this month. And that the budget range is every from 500,000 to $10 million. Um, there are other jurisdictions like Georgia and Louisiana who are competitors of ours. Uh, they're not quite as busy. The higher budgeted films, which they traditionally would get, they don't seem to be happening as frequently. And people are looking at us in Mississippi and going, wait, how are you guys busy? Well, we're busy because all of you independent filmmakers are, are I don't know, that maybe there's a little bit of, a, like you said, opportunity in this chaos that the independent filmmakers are finding um, some creative funding. It's not as much money, so people are willing to invest there. Um, so I'm, I'm real hopeful for what's to come. Uh, I'm real interested in seeing new filmmakers come to us. The five projects that we've had this past year, this past month, um, they are repeat producers. So they've been to Mississippi at least a dozen times each. So that's really hopeful to see too, that there are producers that are working regularly and coming back to a place that seems to work for their budgets. Thank you. Um, I would just add that I'm really seeing a lot of people come to us um, with really unique financing structures and ways in which to create content you know I've it's kind of I've been doing this for almost 20 years and I've I was here before 
the sort of streaming boom and that sort of bubble that happened. Now it's really going back to where it was 15 years ago where people are putting together funds. They're going out to equity investors. Um, I have one client who's just a, a high net worth individual who's been in theater for a long time. And she was approached by a very prominent um, studio producer and writer who now want to develop their own stuff. So they're turning to her saying, well, can you finance our development and then we'll put together these packages and then we'll bring it out to the market. And so they're just be kind of becoming independent producers. They almost think that they're creating, they're like reinventing the wheel. They're like, what do you think about this model? I'm like, well, this is what people have been doing for a very long time. Um, and so I'm just seeing a lot of that. And I think it's, I, I actually love doing that. I think it's really interesting because it's not people going to, what's a standard? What's a standard? It's more like, how can we make this work? You know, how can we, then this is our unique situation. And I love being able to have that flexibility rather than, you know, just kind of doing the cookie cutter deals. It's, it's kind of fun. Thank you so much to Lisa, Nina, Steve, and Christine for joining us for this scintillating conversation. And I hope all of you will walk away with something new that you've learned. Enjoy the rest of the forum. Thank you. Thank you.